Hey everybody, welcome to Lockheed Martin's hydrodynamic tunnel video. In this video, we're going to show you what a hydrodynamic tunnel is and talk about some examples of aerodynamic principles as seen in our tunnel. But before we get started, we want to take a minute to say thank you to the University of Kentucky for hosting this virtual E-Day event in celebration of National Engineers Week. We hope you guys enjoy this video and all of the other awesome events and videos that UK has in store for you. Without further ado, let's talk about hydrodynamic tunnels. Here is an image and video of the hydrodynamic tunnel we built. Let's start by talking about what exactly a hydrodynamic tunnel is. It's very similar to a wind tunnel, which we use to study the flow of air over various objects. A hydrodynamic tunnel is used to study the flow of water over various objects. Basically, we want to be able to submerge objects underwater and then look at how the water moves around that object, which means we need our water to be moving pretty quickly and we need to be able to see those flow lines. If you look at this image on the left, you can see what our hydrodynamic tunnel looks like in full. This video on the right is zoomed in on the viewing pane of the tunnel, and in this case, we're looking at how water flows over this square shape, which we can move around using magnets. Let's talk a little bit about how the tunnel works. Here I have a top-down view of our water tunnel without any water in it so we can see exactly what's inside. First things first, we have a small fish tank that we use to hold all of the water. And we need that water to be moving so we can see what happens to the flow over certain shapes, so we need to add a water pump. Now, if we just put water in a pump into a fish tank, the flow won't be fast enough or clear enough for us to really see how it's affected by various shapes. So we need to control the path of the flow by creating circular flow within the tank, which we do by placing blocks into the middle and corners of the tank to help shape the flow the way we want. You'll notice this front area of the tank has a much smaller space for the water to flow through. This helps the water increase in speed so we can make sure that the water is moving pretty quickly over our test shapes. But if the water moves too quickly, it can become turbulent and messy. We want the water to flow in straight lines, and for that, we use core flute. If you're not sure what core flute is, it looks like this. It's made up of a bunch of small tubes, so as the water flows through these tubes, it's forced to come out in a straight line. And that brings us to our viewing pane, which is this front section of our fish tank that we can look through to see the flow of water. We can use magnets to raise and lower test shapes into this front viewing pane to study the changes in the flow. To make the flow a bit easier to see, we add a tiny bit of something called mica powder, which are the shiny particles you'll see in our example videos that will help us visualize the flow. So now that we understand what a hydrodynamic tunnel is, let's look at some examples. The first example we're going to look at is an aircraft and the forces that create flight. Everything on our planet experiences gravity, which is the force that holds us on the ground. This means that every object, including this aircraft, has a weight that keeps it down. In order for our aircraft to fly, we need to generate lift, which is a force that pushes our aircraft up off of the ground. When we create more lift than the aircraft weighs, that's when we take flight. So how do we create lift? The secret to lift lies in the shape of the wing. If we were to cut this wing in half and look at it from the side, we would see a shape that looks like this. This shape is called an airfoil. Let's take a little closer look at this airfoil. Here we have an airfoil shape that is at a slight angle. So maybe this is our wing tilted upwards to help us take off. We need to look at the airflow over the shape, and there are two paths that we will look at. The first path is the flow of air over the bottom of the shape, and the second path is the flow of air over the top of the shape. If we trace two particles of air over the surface of this airfoil, we can see that the orange path is traveling slightly faster to keep up with the blue path. It's easiest to see this at the beginning and end of the paths, so let's watch one more time. This difference in speed is because the blue path is actually a little bit shorter, so that particle of air can travel at a lower velocity or a lower speed, which creates this pocket of high pressure beneath the shape. On the opposite side, the orange path is a little bit longer, which means that the particle has to travel faster and creates an area of low pressure. 
Our high and low pressure pockets is what creates lift, which is a force pushing on the bottom of this airfoil from the high pressure pocket towards the low pressure pocket. If you're interested in seeing the equations behind lift and pressure, we'll cover those at the very end of this video. For now, let's look at an example of our airfoil shape in our hydrodynamic tunnel. You can see here what we were talking about earlier. The water flowing across the top of the airfoil is moving a bit quicker than the water on the bottom of the airfoil. So this is where we would have lift pushing upwards on this shape. Now you can see right at the end of the airfoil, we have what we call turbulent flow. It's not nice, neat streamlines anymore, but instead you can see some vortex flow happening. This will be easier to see on our next video. So in this case, we've increased the angle of our airfoil to really show you turbulent flow. You can see what we call the separation point, which is right about here. So this is where our nice, neat flow is separated from our more turbulent vortex flow, which is all of this happening at the back of the airfoil. For aircraft, our control over the aircraft using flaps and control surfaces relies on laminar flow, which allows us to take advantage of pressure differences caused by airflow over the surface of the wing, just like we talked about before. When we get turbulent flow like this, our aircraft can do what we call stalling, which decreases the amount of lift we're generating and reduces the amount of control we have over the aircraft. So hopefully this helps you visualize some aerodynamic concepts like lift and stall. Next, we're gonna talk about spacecraft. Specifically, we're gonna look at the shape of a spacecraft for their re-entry into Earth's atmosphere after successfully completing their mission. Now you'll notice in this illustration, the space capsule, which is where the astronauts are, is not pointed in the most aerodynamic way, but rather points the rounded, blunt end of this capsule first. There are two primary reasons for this, drag and temperature distribution. When the capsule enters the atmosphere, the air directly in front of it experiences extremely high temperatures, which is why our front surface is covered in a heat shield. Blunt shapes, ones with a larger front surface area, help to dissipate that heat and move it away from the capsule. This larger surface also helps to balance lift and drag. If we come into the atmosphere too fast, we may not be able to control our descent and slow down enough before landing, and the higher re-entry speed will cause higher temperatures that our heat shield may not be able to handle. Let's take a look at a few examples using our hydrodynamic tunnel. The first shape we're going to look at is a triangle. This would be like if our capsule entered the atmosphere nose first. You can see here that this flow is moving really quick. It would be difficult for us to balance this speed for a controlled descent. This square is the opposite extreme. We would get quite a bit of drag from the front of this square, but you can see that we have some turbulent vortex flow right on the front surface. The air on that surface might get trapped instead of moving the air away quickly like we want to. And that brings us to the sphere. You can see this shape does a better job of balancing the two goals that we have. The flow is pretty continuous and will help with moving heat away from the capsule, but like the square, this is still a larger, more blunt surface which helps give us the opportunity to control our speed using drag. The next example we're going to look at is a race car, where we can use drag and pressure to make quick turns. This is a top-down view of a Formula One race car. We're going to talk about two topics for this car, drafting and downforce. Drafting is a technique where two drivers line up and follow each other closely. What happens with drafting is that the front car is pushing through a bunch of air particles that are stationary and unmoving. There's a high pressure pocket right at the front of the car and it experiences drag from all that pushing. Now behind the car we have the opposite effect. We have a low pressure region of oftentimes turbulent airflow that's caused by this car moving forward and creating a gap behind it that the air has to rush into to fill. So if another car comes up behind this one, it can get a bit of a boost from this low pressure area reducing drag which helps the following car go a little bit faster. And as that car in the back gets closer and closer, the high pressure region on the front of that car can actually give a little bump to the car in front. 
and it gives a little boost, if you will, so this can actually be beneficial for both parties, and you'll see this practice in a range of sports like cycling and others, not just racing. This is an example outline of a car in our hydrodynamic tunnel, and you can see a little bit of what we were talking about before, with some turbulent airflow behind the car that's representative of a low pressure area. Formula One cars actually take aerodynamics even further. They use it to create downforce, which is essentially the opposite of lift, and that downforce helps them make sharp turns faster. There are two areas of the car that create downforce from their shape, the front and back wings. These wings aren't just for looks, they also create downforce by acting as a sort of upside down airfoil like we talked about earlier. They create high pressure regions on top and low pressure regions below which results in force pushing down on these wings. But this still isn't enough downforce, so how do we create more? The shape of the car is actually unique in that the car itself creates a low pressure region. These intakes on the side of the car control flow within and underneath the car by ensuring the flow remains smooth and laminar. The outside of the car, however, has plenty of interference and turbulent air caused by things like tires and everything else. This creates a high pressure region above the car and a low pressure region underneath the car, essentially creating a vacuum that sucks the car down towards the ground. More downforce. This is an example of creating downforce. You will remember this airfoil shape from earlier in the presentation, but this time we've angled it downwards a bit to better represent the wings of the F1 car. You can see the reverse of an aircraft wing happening here. The flow on the top surface is faster, meaning we have a pocket of high pressure, which is how we get our downforce. Now that we've seen some examples, let's talk about some of the math behind these ideas. Let's talk about lift first. And remember, the Formula One car's downforce operates on the same principle, just in the reverse. Lift can be calculated as one half times the coefficient of lift, which is a value dependent on the object's shape, in this case the shape of our airfoil, multiplied by the density of air, multiplied by the velocity of the object squared, multiplied by the surface area of the wing. So if we have all of these values, we can calculate the lift, and so long as the lift is greater than our weight, the object will move upwards and take flight. Next, let's talk about how we know that lower velocity means higher pressure, and how we can do that is by looking at Bernoulli's equation. If we take this equation and simplify it by removing the constants, which in this case are density and gravity multipliers, we end up with a comparison of pressure and velocity. So for this equation to work, if we have a lower velocity on the left side in blue, we would need a higher pressure value to make up for it, and vice versa for the higher velocity in orange on the right side of the equation. Last but not least, let's touch on spacecraft re-entry. When we talk about spacecraft re-entry, we talk about shape in terms of ballistic coefficient, which is calculated by taking the mass of the object divided by its coefficient of drag multiplied by the cross-sectional area. Now, coefficient of drag is something that's determined using a wind tunnel, which is not unlike our water tunnel we've been using on all of these examples. Looking at our equation for drag, which is one half times the density of air multiplied by our velocity squared multiplied by our coefficient of drag multiplied by our area, we can see that a high coefficient of drag would result in a higher drag force. So if we want more drag, if we want to slow down faster, we have a high coefficient of drag. And looking back at our ballistic coefficient, a high coefficient of drag would result in a lower ballistic coefficient. So objects with a low ballistic coefficient would experience more drag and slow down faster. On behalf of Lockheed Martin, thank you for listening to us and participating in UK's E-Day event celebrating National Engineers Week. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and encourage you to take a look at the other awesome E-Day events and videos. Thanks, and we'll see you next year. At Lockheed Martin, we're on a mission. Your mission. When millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us. To build the impossible 
to invent the inconceivable and solve every problem with speed and reliability. Every mission is an expedition of the greatest importance, both to you and to us.